is a different sort of random act of anatomy. What we're going to be doing today is actually having a science cafe uh, here in my research lab at, o at Ohio University. Ohio University has, has, a, has had a science cafe series for a long time. It's usually held in a cafe at the front room on campus. But we're in the middle of a pandemic, and so uh, we can't do that. So what we're going to do is actually run this in my lab. And what I'm going to do, stay with me, I'll be roaming around our lab, talking about various sorts of projects that we've been doing over the years. We'll talk to some of our students, graduate students and undergrads. We'll even talk to one of our students that's, uh, that's been working uh, remotely. So first, um, again, my name is Larry Whitmer. I'm a professor here um, in the Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. I'm also the Chang Professor of, of Paleontology. And I've been here for about 25 years, and I've been in this lab for, for, for going on 20 years. And so we have developed here lots and lots of resources for looking at how animals evolve. We're particularly interested in things like dinosaurs, but to, in order to understand dinosaurs, we need to really look at a variety of different kinds of animals and use a variety of different kinds of, 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 of approaches to get at some of these questions. One thing that we're also doing today is to recognize that um, uh, we're approaching National Fossil Day, and, and October is almost unofficially National Fossil Month. National Fossil Day is actually put on by the National Park Service, so I'll wear my official National Fossil Day hat, and let you know that National Fossil Day is a day when the National Park Service um, has encouraged um, our entire country to really recognize the, the, the sort of the fossil, the paleontological resources that we have around us, particularly in our national parks. And one thing I can tell you also is, is associated with National Fossil Day is that they've got this amazing um, uh, coloring book, the Prehistoric Life in National Parks coloring book, which you can get or you can download. And actually, if you look in the, um, in the description, uh, you'll actually be able to see links to National Fossil Day and where you can actually download a PDF of that, of that comic book. So what I'd like to do is talk about how we get at some of these questions that we have about the history of life. Many of our questions come from dinosaurs, the crazy features that they have. We can look at some of these animals and say, why do they have these horns or these huge noses or why is T-Rex T-Rex, why is it so big and crazy? A lot of those questions, though, can't be answered just by looking at dinosaurs. Uh, in many cases, what we really need to do is to look at the, um, the modern day relatives of dinosaurs. The reality is that dinosaurs, to a certain extent, are just a pile of bones. And in, in and of themselves, they don't really do anything. So really what we need to do is we need to look at animals that actually still have soft tissues that we can dissect, uh, physiology that we can measure, behavior that we can observe. And so not just any modern day animals are, are, are most relevant to us. Certainly uh, the animals today that are most closely related to birds or to dinosaurs are in fact birds, something like this, this, this stork over here or this cassowary over here. These are birds, in fact, these are a kind of dinosaur. Next most closely related to, to, um, to dinosaurs, past birds, are gonna be crocodilians, alligators like this one, and, uh, and, and crocodiles. And then things like lizards are, are more remotely related. Here's an iguana right here. Even very distantly related um, animals like mammals often can be very relevant comparisons for us. And we'll look at some examples of that as we go through uh, the tour of our lab. You'll see a mixture of fossils as well as modern day specimens. Actually, a question I get when people come in here, and incidentally, um, you might be uh, viewing right now the largest density of dinosaur skulls in the state of Ohio. Um, Admittedly, that's probably a fairly low bar. Uh, this is not the part of the country where dinosaurs are actually found. The rocks around here are, are too old. Um, but we still have a lot of dinosaur skulls here. And really, many of the questions that we ask are about the heads of dinosaurs. Within the head is going to be the skull. Um, a lot of folks will ask me when they come in here, wow, are all of these real? 
And the reality is that all of these are actually real representations of the actual fossil, but they're what we call casts, made from molds of the original fossils. In many cases, the original fossils have actually been here for study or for CT scanning, which we'll talk about in a minute. But all we have here are casts, which are these plastic or fiberglass or resin, um, exact replicas of the original fossils. The, we do have original fossils here. They're locked away in cabinets, nice and safe. And a lot of the fossils that we get here on loan immediately go back to their, to their museums as soon as we've done our studies. And we keep the casts as a, as a record of them. A lot of questions I also get are, are all the, the fossils you find these beautiful um, put together skulls like this? The reality is sometimes, sometimes we find fossils that are, are all uh, perfectly or what we call articulated, the bones are connected to each other. But in many cases, uh, the bones are all found separately and then we have to put them back together. In other cases, the skulls are crushed. We'll look at a, uh, what was once a crushed skull uh, right here. And those are harder to work with. Okay, well let's look at some, some questions as how we can get about that and how we can use modern day animals. Here's an animal that we've spent a lot of time on. This is a predatory theropod dinosaur known as Majungasaurus. Um, and its eye socket is right around in there. It's where its eye would be and its nose is down in here. Majungasaurus is a very interesting sort of dinosaur in that it has all kinds of rough bone on the top and the sides of its skull. Um, and it's very curious because not all dinosaurs do that. Lots of dinosaurs have relatively smooth skulls, kind of like our skulls are actually quite smooth, meaning that the soft tissues don't attach as firmly to the, to the bone as they do here. So the questions that we have, again, many of our questions come from dinosaurs, and the question often is as simple as, what's up with that? Why is it like that? And so to answer that, uh, we need to actually look at other kinds of animals. What other kind of animals might have this kind of roughened bone texture? We can actually see in this case, Majungasaurus was actually one of these fossils that was found with separate bones. So for example, this right here is the bone that sits right in here. This right here, this is called the nasal bone, which is just a little bone in us, but it's a large one here. And this is a part of the upper jaw. You can see there's teeth. And this would sort of slot in like that. And that would sort of fit like that. And then this bone would come in called the lacrimal bone. Um, which has the tear duct running through it, which is what the term lacrimal means. And that's going to be sitting right there. And so we can actually study these bones and try to understand what all of this means. And what we do is we look at modern day animals, animals that, can, that we can actually dissect. So we've actually looked very closely at, at birds, like this cassowary right here, which also has some roughened bone, lots of grooves, like we see in, in Majungasaurus right here as well. We can also see that in crocodiles and alligators, like this alligator right here, you can see that the bone is very roughened. And in fact, we know by dissecting alligators that the skin fuses to the skull. Um, and so the question is with these dinosaurs, was that was what was going on here? Well, we need to look further. Um, there's other kinds of dinosaurs that show this. So not just um, uh, Majungasaurus, but some of these bony-headed dinosaurs. This is a dinosaur right here from Mongolia known as Stegosaurus, or I'm sorry, as Prenocephala. Uh, this right here is one from Canada known as Stegosaurus. And these are our pachycephalosaur dinosaurs. Uh, you may have seen these in, in Jurassic Park or in, or in TV documentaries. These are the ones that you may have heard of that may have banged their heads together like that. And one thing we can see is that they also show lots of roughening in the skull. And so the question becomes, what was this roughening for? What does it mean? In some cases, we can tell that the roughening was associated with little spikes and things like that. In other words, they're ornamental, telling us something about the animal, maybe telling us about its age or telling us about its sex. Maybe males or females had these things uh, more developed or, 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 or other. But one thing that we like to do is to look really closely at the structure of the bone. 
So for example, we can see that there's lots of grooves in here. That's very characteristic of what we see with blood vessels and nerves. So we think that there was lots of blood vessels and nerves covering the skin right here. Also, we can see lots of texture in here that's a little different. Um, and so we had to, in a sense, go outside birds and crocodiles and lizards to look at some other comparisons. Some of the comparisons we went through actually were to mammals. So this is a modern day um, giraffe skull right here where you can start to see some of the roughening that in some respects is kind of similar. This is actually a rhinoceros. Um, and so this is a white rhino skull and we can see lots of the uh, roughening that we can see in here. We actually got specimens of these um, and we'll talk about where we get some of our specimens in, in, a, in a little bit. Uh, specimens that we could actually dissect. And so this right here is the horn of a rhinoceros and this is the front part of the bony part. So this part right here actually matches up with that part right there. And the horn would sit on like this. And this structure right back here is the nasal horn that would sit right behind us. So this piece right here would match up right around in there. And so this horn would be sitting right around in that area. And so we can look at the structure of the bone in here, look at it in very close detail, even with microscopic slides. Um, and this was work that was done by one of my former doctoral students uh, uh, named Tobin Hieronymus, who's now a tenured professor at a medical school up in northern Ohio. And one of the things that uh, uh, Tobin found is that there are some similarities in what we see in the, this pattern of, of roughening on the skull to see some of it in, in, has some things that are reminiscent of what we see here in Majungasaurus. And so did Majungasaurus have horns like a rhino? Probably not exactly like that, but it gives us something about how the skin interacts with the bone. And so th this, is the, this horn right here is actually um, a modification of, 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 of structures that come off the skin. Not really hair, but hair-like structures. They're keratin like hair and fingernails, and how those skin structures interact with the bone to actually produce these features are the kinds of things that we study in modern day animals and then help them help us understand what's going in on in extinct animals like Majungasaurus or these Pachycephalosaurus. And so we actually don't think that, that uh, uh, Majungasaurus had, had horns exactly like um, uh, like, like rhinos by any, by any stretch. Although there's some very interesting things right up around here on this lacrimal bone that, that make us wonder whether there was some sort of horn-like covering in, in that area. So uh, we can start to learn about these animals by looking at their modern day relatives. What's sort of an interesting byproduct of that is that by studying these modern day animals like rhinos, we can learn more about dinosaurs. That's why we did it. But if we're studying rhinos, we're going to learn a lot about rhinos. And the reality is that it turns out that although the word rhinoceros actually means nose horn, there actually, we didn't really have much scientific uh, research into how the horn actually attaches to the bone of the nose. And so we actually wound up doing an entire publication that was senior authored by Tobin Hieronymus. Um, on rhino horn, how it grows and how it attaches to the skull. And um, in fact, that, that, that publication is, 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 um, is, is linked in the, in the description. Now, we didn't even mention the word dinosaur in the article on, on rhinos. We don't need dinosaurs to make rhinos really interesting. Uh, but that's sort of a benefit of a lot of the research that we do, is that our questions come from dinosaurs, but to answer them, we need to dig deep into what's going on with modern animals today. What is their anatomy like? What is their physiology and behavior like? And, and a key part here is how does that write its signature into the bones? We're ultimately looking for the signatures left on the bones by the soft tissues. Whether those soft tissues are skin, like we're talking about here, or whether it's muscles, or blood vessels, or nerves, or brains, um, lots of things that we, that we study. So um, what I'm going to do now is actually walk around the corner here and show you how we applied some of these approaches to a different project. So one of our main projects um, relates to, 
Do we have a question? We actually do have a question. Great. Okay, so your first question actually harkens back to a talk where you were saying how you get you know, these specimens from a museum, and somebody wants to know, are they FedEx? <laughs> <laughs> So it's a great question. How do we actually get these specimens from, from museums? Um, and, and the answer is sometimes is FedEx. Yes, there are fossils that we can FedEx. And the beauty of FedEx or any of these other courier uh, services is that they track things really, really well. But the reality is for, for a lot of the specimens, particularly the large specimens, is that we go and get them. We, can, we hand carry these fossils. Uh, these are treasures. These are unique specimens. These are things that uh, have to be treated with the utmost care. And consequently, uh, for, for large, delicate fossils, uh, they're packed by professionals um, in shipping crates. We carry them lovingly, never, li never leave our, our, our site. Um, and then we bring them back here. And then we return them uh, the same way. So it's a pretty big deal to get some of these things um, on loan. And we'll talk about why we actually want to bring a lot of these fossils back. The reality is that we go to museums uh, more than fossils, than the, than the museums come to us, than the fossils come to us. And so we travel the world, or travel actually the North America has a lot of fossils, but we go around uh, wherever those fossils have to be. It's been a lot harder during the pandemic. We can't do that kind of travel, and it's changed the way that we have to do our science. Okay. Well, thanks for that question. That was a, a great one. And what I want to talk about now is, is a project that we did um, a few years ago that builds on some of these themes that we're talking about. How do we understand how these extinct animals, in this case, the, 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 an animal no, known as Allosaurus, another predatory dinosaur, how these animals moved? And so this project was led by um, a scientist named Eric Snively. Um, at the time, he was uh, studying mechanical engineering here and was doing postdoctoral research in our lab. And he's now at Oklahoma State University as a tenured professor. And we published this article in 2013. And again, you can download this article by uh, a link in the description. We were interested in how this remarkable animal would have moved its, its head and neck around. So where did we start? Well, it always starts with the fossils. Where we, uh, and what we did was um, we got the uh, fossils, or in this case, the cast. And this is a replica of the neck. All of these bones are separate right here. And I can't grab them all because I don't have enough hands. Whoops, look out. <laughs> Fortunately, these are not the real bones right here. So we could put these things together here and not drop them. There we go. There we go. And it sits on like that. So that, that, this is the, uh, the neck of Allosaurus right here. And ultimately what we did is we took these to a local hospital, Ohio Health Oblenis Hospital here in Athens, Ohio. We scanned all of these bones in individually as well as the skull individually. Because what we wanted to do was to basically reconstruct the soft tissue. Um, and Eric uh, Snively is an expert in particular on the neck structure of dinosaurs. And he was able to, based on his studies, which again looked at modern day birds and crocodilians and lizards, was able to figure out all of the bony doodads that relate to the muscles of the neck. And then our team, myself, and Ryan Ridgely, who's um, a research associate in, in our lab, actually worked on fleshing out the skull. And it turns out we needed to, to figure out how, how, how all these different components fit together. And in particular for the mechanical studies, and this is sort of the end result right here, um, how they actually contributed to this functioning system. So we wanted to, re to, to reconstruct not just the muscles of the neck, but the muscles of the jaws, uh, the eyes, and this whole area in here is filled with air sinuses. And so we wanted to reconstruct those as well. And this was sort of the result. We published um, an article about this in 2013. And really, and, uh, Eric is a, a marvel of using engineering approaches to get at function. And in this case, he used uh, uh, an engineering approach that's borrowed from, from robotics called multi-body dynamics. And this is not actually the program album. That was very te technical and sciencey looking. 
What this was is actually work that Ryan Ridgely did in our lab in a 3D animation program called Maya that took all that scientific work and put it in sort of a more understandable uh, sort of form. So what you can see right here are the muscles that Eric's work um, was able to reconstruct using all of these bones. You can see the jaw muscles and the eye and this big air sinus here in the front. There's the nostril right there. And getting all of those things allowed us, in a sense, to do the things that, that Eric needed for his, his, math, his math, which was to actually divide up all of this thing into, into areas and figure out how much each component of these things weighed. Because that actually fit into the math of how these muscles could move this head and neck around. A very elegant study that drew on all of our knowledge accumulated together on, on the modern day relatives of birds, but then we're able to apply it to this dinosaur. And what it, it did is it gave us some real insight into feeding. That this dinosaur, although it looks superficially like T. rex, or these other tyrannosaurs over here, fundamentally fed in a different way, where it tended to actually, um, actually um, um, reach down into flesh and actually pull it back, sort of tugging on it. You can sort of see that right here. This muscle right in here was a key component of that. That was a key finding, that the muscle came from the neck and attached here. Uh, Eric's work has shown that in animals like T. rex, they were more like a dog and used, potentially shook their head from side to side. And so by using these kinds of approaches, we can drill down and actually look at functional and behavioral dif differences between different kinds of dinosaurs that are superficially very similar. I think we've got another question. Rox? We do. It's related to what you're talking about. So people want to know when they're watching movies like Jurassic Park and other movies, are they using your science to inform the way that the dinosaurs move? <laughs> Yeah, well, we wonder the same. Are, these, um, are, are, the, are the movie makers actually um, uh, paying attention to the, to the science? And the answer is yes and no, and actually. It, it, it's true. They, uh, Jurassic Park had um, a very famous paleontologist, Jack Horner, um, as, uh, as a technical advisor, so he was overseeing a lot of the science. Uh, with the new Jurassic World movie, uh, Steve Brusati, one of my colleagues um, that's over in Scotland now, is the scientific advisor for, for the new Jurassic World movie. And I think how they would characterize this and how much science goes into the, uh, the, the dinosaurs you see in the movie is you win some battles, you lose some others. In other words, we try to get as much science into the movies as possible, but Hollywood makes its own decisions based on the things that they need to. The dinosaurs need to look really cool, and they may need to do them for plot reasons to do certain things. But um, we have been very gratified that, um, um, that many of our findings actually do find their way into, into the movies. One of... Um, um, one of the early studies we did actually looked at the position of the nostril, the opening of the nasal cavity. And, and we did this study and it turned out that the nostrils were in a different position than what we had thought previously. And I remember my, my son and I, my son Sam, when he was a little kid, we went to see uh, uh, King Kong, the Jack Black King Kong uh, movie, um, which actually had amazing dinosaurs in it. Skull Island is actually where all the action happens on that movie. And, and it was kind of cool because they actually made the dinosaurs consistent with the work that we had done here. And my son actually leaned over to me in the movie and he said, hey, Dad, they're using your nostrils. And so it's actually a very proud moment for me as, as a parent as well as a scientist. So, yes, they actually do watch the science. The movie makers want the movies to be scientifically accurate, but they also are driven by, by plot and some of the, the, the constraints that they have. You got another question. I do, and it's from a four-year-old. Great. Yeah. Um, so uh, Lindsay wants to know, how did dinosaurs get their name? Is it related to their structure? Yeah. So Lindsay, that's a great question. How do we name, name dinosaurs? How do they get their scientific names? And actually, um, they are often related to their, to their, uh, to their structure. Uh, sometimes it's from where they're, they're, they're from. Sometimes dinosaurs are named after where they came from. Sometimes they're named after, after people. Um, uh, but very often the names will have s specific meaning. And to actually illustrate that, let me actually walk around to our T-Rex cove over here, uh, which we can see over here. 
Because it gives us an opportunity. That's well-timed, Lindsay. It's a great question because it gives us a, a chance to actually talk about T-Rex a little bit. And today, October 5th, is a special day for T-Rex. It's its birthday. So what does it mean for a dinosaur to have a birthday? Obviously, um, T-Rex lived millions and millions of years ago, and individually they all were born on different days, just like, like, like we are. But the name Tyrannosaurus Rex was born 115 years ago on October 5th. And what we mean by that is a scientist actually looked at a collection of fossils and decided what name went to those fossils. And so, in fact, um, these fossils right here, these white bones here, um, um, are actually what we call the holotype fossil, meaning the name-bearing fossils, the ones that were originally found. Uh, these were found in 1902, and in 1905, um, the scientist uh, that, that named these chose the name Tyrannosaurus rex. And what that name means, the rex means king, and Tyrannosaurus sort of means tyrant reptile. And this was sort of the king of the tyrant lizards. And so um, these are very special fossils because uh, what the holotype means is that these are the ones that we know are Tyrannosaurus rex because these were the ones to which the name was applied. Things like this, we actually are pretty sure are Tyrannosaurus rex. In other words, we think that this animal is pretty much the same thing as this one over here, but the reality is that this is the one in the name, is, is the name bearer, the holotype, and this is what we call a referred specimen, meaning that we think that this specimen is referred to T-rex because of its similarities. Well, let's look at some of these similarities. For example, this right here is the upper jaw, the left maxilla. And you can see it's the same bone right in here. So I can hold that up there, and you can see um, that this is the left maxilla all put in place right here. This specimen, for those of you keeping score at home, this is AMNH5027, um, which is a specimen, a very famous specimen um, from the Natural History Museum in, in, um, in, in New York City, the American Museum of Natural History. So we were really fortunate that we got to study these um, the holotype bones. And again, these are all separate bones. And we actually went up to the, the Carnegie Museum in, 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 in uh, Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh. And myself and this um, undergraduate student, honors tutorial college student Emily Caggiano and I had the opportunity to go into the exhibit and study the original skeleton. Now this skull that's on exhibit uh, that was uh, assembled beautifully by Michael Holland, actually has casts of the bones. All the, 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 the skeleton behind the skull is all original, or mostly original, that's mounted here. But these bones, the originals, were actually in the collection. And thank you to the uh, Carnegie Museum and Matt Lamana, the curator, allowed us to actually take um, the original bones and actually bring them back to, to Athens, Ohio. So these are the original holotype fossils right, right here. Um, in our lab that allowed us to study them. And then the key thing that we did, part of the reason we got these things on loan was that we could do things we couldn't do at the Carnegie Museum. Yes, we went to Carnegie Museum and studied them there, but we actually needed to come back here so we could CT scan them. And here is myself and my former student, Ruger Porter, um, at Ohio Health Oblenis Hospital here in, in Athens, CT scanning um, this bone right here, which is this one right here, the left dentary, which is this lower jaw bone right here, uh, CT scanning it at the hospital. And so CT scanning uses x-rays to actually um, peer inside the fossils, to sort of look through the rock, look through the bone to see inside. And so what we can see here is the bone here, and this right here is a slice through it. So if I were to flip this around, what this is, is a slice running right through here, and if you've pulled this away, so we can see all the, the tooth roots in there. So CT scanning is something that we do a lot, and it allows us to do um, detailed anatomical work that we couldn't do otherwise, and that's really the main reason that we get these bones on loan for study. And so we've done lots of different kinds of studies with this, actually. Um, 
Uh, Emily Caggiano and I spent a lot of time uh, before she graduated working on, on this holotype specimen. Um, and we actually wound up doing a whole series of videos. They were called Dissecting with Emily videos. And there's actually a link to that in the description as well. Um, and so we looked at lots of things like, um, like some of the pathology. For example, this is um, another one of the, the lower jaws of, of T. rex. And we can see a pathology right here, which is from an infection. But we can also see big gashes in the jaw right here that actually represent um, wounds, healed wounds, bite marks. And so this T. rex got bitten in the face. And the question sort of becomes, Who's going to bite a T-Rex? It's a legit question. And the reality is the only one that's going to bite a T-Rex is another T-Rex. And so this actually gives us a window into the kinds of behaviors that T-Rex might have engaged in. We can look to modern animals today. And you can look at dogs that are running around in your neighborhood or in your living room. And they'll often bite each other in the face. They'll do play biting, but they'll also do real biting if they're, if they're truly fighting. And so we can use CT scanning to study that as well. Another thing that we've done a lot with with CT scanning is to look at brain structure. And this is the brain of T-Rex uh, right in here. And so this is one where we CT the skull of, of uh, back into the skull of T-Rex and then we're able to use software to basically extract what the brain structure of T-Rex would like. And in reality, and we'll look at this in a second, this isn't really exactly what the brain was like. This is what the inside of the cavity within the skull um, where the brain was in life uh, was, was what that looks like. And so this would sit way up in here, except right down in there. So that's where the, the brain would be. The spinal cord would be coming right out here, and that's where that would be coming out. But this gives us a window, once again, into what's going on inside the mind of this tyrant king. Um, what's happening in there? What were his senses like? And we've learned lots of things. And again, this, we've published on this, and the link to the publication is in the description. We've seen that this area, um, associated with the sense of smell, was enlarged in T-Rex. And in fact, T-Rex has a really big nose. This whole area, from here to here, is basically nasal cavity. And so the air was coming in here and coming down like this. But this part of the snout, but back in here, was actually where uh, odors were being discriminated and then processed in the brain right in here. This is where the, the cerebrum, the cerebral hemispheres, the higher centers of the brain, and they're, they're pretty expanded. Um, and so uh, we can look at the brain and get a notion of the sensory capabilities of these animals. And for T-Rex, what we see are the senses of an active predator, a pursued predator. And so uh, we know that that was part of its ancestry and apparently was important uh, for these guys and adults. We've got another question. We do. So based on inferences from the nasal cavity and also this ripping versus shaking that you were talking about earlier, does it tell you anything about the hunting strategies or prey preferences for these animals? Yeah, great question, which is, what does this information tell us about the behavior of these animals? And the reality is it does. It tells us something about them. So we can see that T. rex was enormously powerful. This back end of the skull, uh, Colin, if you walk around to the front here, the front of this thing, you can actually see the depth of this skull. This skull is very, very wide, and that's because there's gigantic jaw muscles back here. One of my former uh, doctoral students, Casey Holliday, now a tenured professor at Missouri, did his dissertation studying the muscles of T. rex and, and other dinosaurs. So he knows more about it than, than anyone. But a huge muscular system. The teeth in T. rex, such as this one right here, were very, very strong, very thick. They weren't really knife-like. They were much thicker than that. Some people sort of think they look like bananas or, or, uh, or railroad spikes, if anybody knows what a railroad spike looks like anymore. Um, and so these were different sorts of, of animals. These guys could bite really hard. They may have actually been choosing to eat bone, to actually crunch bones. But this is an adult T-Rex. What were the youngsters like? Well, we've been asking that question because lots of people are interested in how dinosaurs grow. And it turns out we have information on the growth of dinosaurs. This right here is a teenage T-Rex. Uh, from the Burpee Museum of Natural History in Rockford, Rockford, Illinois, uh, colloquially known as Jane. And this was maybe a teenager. 
at about, um, and we can see it's a different sort of thing. The teeth are, are much thinner um, than what we see in the adult T-Rex, and the skull isn't quite as expanded to the side. The jaw muscles are still big, but not to what we see in the adult. What we also did was we wanted to understand what a, a really young T-Rex uh, was like. And so we were contacted in about 2015 by the um, Museum of the Rockies, and they were doing a brand new exhibit on, on Tyrannosaurs, and they wanted um, a really young, maybe almost a baby Tyrannosaur. They had some fossils of a, just the lower jaw of, an, of a dinosaur called um, Chomper. That was its nickname. And they asked us, is there any way we could make a dinosaur, a Tyrannosaur, that looked like a baby that would sort of be the size of Chomper? And the reality is, we did that. And so this is a 3D print. Ryan Ridgely and I um, uh, put this together. And some of the original fossils of, of Chomper are actually in the lower jaw here. But we used a mixture of a couple of things to, to generate this model, uh, one of which was the structure of Jane. So we knew it, what uh, Jane was like from fossils. But we also were able to, to look at the skull of this animal right here. This is an animal that's from the, the um, Asian cousin of T-Rex known as Tarbosaurus. This is a teenage Tarbosaurus right here. And Tarbosaurus would have grown up to be almost identical to T-Rex. Very, very similar. In 2011, we actually published an article in um, the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. Again, you can download that article uh, with a link in the description that was looking at this dinosaur right here. This is a dinosaur that actually was just about the same size as the fossil fragments that we had of Chomper. And these animals were so closely related that between Jane and this Tarbosaurus juvenile, we were able to come up with a very credible view of what um, a two-year-old uh, Tyrannosaur skull would look like. And you hear about terrible twos. This would be a pretty terrible two. And so this was an animal that's maybe seven or eight feet long, maybe nine, um, and a very different beast than what we see with T. rex, suggesting that, that um, this basically played a different role in the ecosystem than T. rex. Even though it was two, this was no toddler. This was an animal that you know, was big and probably fast, much faster and more agile than adult T. rex, which weighed you know, seven tons or more. Um, and so these animals are about the size of the, the skull is about the size of the raptors in Jurassic Park. And so what's sort of interesting is the answer to the question, does, the, does this kind, do these kinds of studies give us insight into how these animals um, lived and what they ate? The answer is absolutely yes. And as we get further into this, we can actually see how that actually changed as they went through their life. And we've got another question, Rox. Okay, I'm just going to give you a warning that we uh, supposedly have about 22 minutes left, so yep. I'll try not to interrupt too much, but this is a relevant question. So, if the morphology of young dinosaurs are different compared to adults, how do you really know that they're the same species? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and there are debates about this, because these fossils don't come out of the ground with labels on them. So it's us, up to us scientists to sort of figure that out. And in some cases, like with the Tarbosaurus, this, um, this thing right here, we actually had adults of, that were pretty much the same. We could tell that we had um, sort of teenagers and adults around, so it seemed like we had a pretty good sense with that. Likewise, with the T-Rex, we've got a pretty good handle on how um, these fossils were found within the rocks and the ages of the rocks to suggest that there's a really good chance that they all pertain to a, to a single species. But the reality is we need to be really careful. So T-Rex has a lot to tell. It's T-Rex's birthday, so we spent some extra time on it. What I'd like to do now is to, sh to go through and talk to you about some of the research we're doing with some of our students. And we've actually got here a student, Daniel Dunphy, who is um, um, an undergrad in our um, Department of Geological Sciences here at Ohio University. And the reality is that we've all been doing most of our work um, remotely, and Daniel's done a ton of work uh, remotely um, as well. The project that, that Daniel's working on is on this animal over here, a small plant-eating dinosaur um, known as Dryosaurus. And so we were able to, once again, from the Carnegie Museum, they were kind enough to loan us 
uh, the fossils of Dryosaurus. This is um, an adult right here, so it's a relatively small dinosaur, um, as well as, um, if I can get this to stay there, a baby. So this is a baby Dryosaurus right here, and you can sort of see in this image over here some of our CT scans of them. And so Daniel has been working on this project, uh, mostly remotely now, um, and actually next week he's going to be presenting a, a poster on Dryosaurus. He's going to be presenting this work at the virtual meeting of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. So Daniel, we have um, CT scanned the skull, these skulls. What did, what, what did you do with them once we got the CT scan data? Right, so what I basically did was digitally highlight the bones within the fossil itself. Um, so this fossil is actually still encased in matrix. And so what I've done is go through, like Dr. Weber said, with the slices, and visually highlight each and individual bone. There's still a lot of bone left to go, but we've made a lot of progress really far that's let us see totally new things that we've never seen. So what are some of the, the features that we can see here that, so this is the baby, this is the juvenile right here. Um, and, the, and the cool thing about the CT scan is not only can we look inside, but we can make it bigger than what the, the, the baby uh, was like. So um, what, how do we know this is a baby? Right, so juveniles tend to have larger orbits with regard to the rest of the skull. And so if we go back to this, we can see how huge the orbit is compared to the adult. And so that's how we're fairly sure that this one is a juvenile. But um, as for some of the things that we can see, for example, we have this bone here that was entirely encased in matrix that existed before. Uh, and so we're able to see things like that that are totally new. Yeah, so CT scanning has really transformed our ability to approach problems like this. I mean, one thing that Daniel has found is that the, apparently the, the number of teeth change as these guys get older. That Daniel found that there is actually 12 teeth in the jaw and or in, in each side of the jaw in the baby but in the adult, it actually goes up to 14. And so we're starting to, what that means is something that we're still trying to figure out. But um, as we start to piece together um, uh, these kinds of stories, and Daniel's still got some work to do on this, but, um, um, and in fact, this will be part of his, his thesis in the Honors Tutorial College. Uh, so you can check back with us to see where, where Daniel's going with this project. So thanks a lot, Daniel, appreciate it. Um, actually, Daniel's um, sort of perched there in front of Dinosaur National Monument, and these fossils were actually found in Dinosaur Ma National Monument, which is mo um, managed by the National Park Service, so it's very appropriate for, for National Fossil Day. And I'd like to, to actually talk to another student over here. This is um, Jan Nassif, and she's um, um, uh, sort of, our, our, she's, she's our senior uh, PhD student right now. And um, it's okay being the senior student, that's all right. Um, and what she's going to talk to us about is an aspect of, of, of her research, which she's also presenting. She's giving a talk next week at the uh, Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting. So Jan, what have you been up to? Yeah, so uh, like Larry talked about, um, you know, we're using modern animals in order to better understand uh, the anatomy and the morphology, um, particularly of the soft tissues in uh, Fossil, you know, by extinct animals from fossils when that information isn't available. And so the system that I'm most interested in for my research, for the, what my dissertation is about, uh, is the hearing system in extinct animals. And just like us, uh, birds, reptiles have an eardrum, they have an ear system they always, that you can hear, but it evolved completely independently of the hearing apparatus that mammals evolved and that we inherited from our mammalian ancestors. And so it functions in a very, very different way. And so one of the things that I'm really curious about is how did that uh, hearing system, how did the function of the ear change through millions and millions of years, especially within non-avian dinosaurs? And then as well as that, how do we get to what we see in modern birds? And so the stuff that I'm presenting in SVP is specifically focused on these relatives of birds in the fossil record. So these, what we call these like the theropod dinosaurs, or what a lot of people think of as meat-eating dinosaurs. And so I'm working with everything from, you know, Archaeopteryx, very famously being, you know, being this feathered dinosaur related to birds, 
along with some of the more along with some of the more charismatic ones, such as like Velociraptor and um, you know some of these Oviraptorosaurs. These all these um, across all these different body sizes and all these different um, sort of behavioral categories and feeding behaviors, uh, all the way up to uh, dinosaurs, just like Larry was talking about, like uh, Tyrannosaurus, um, who exist in this sort of size category that's outside of anything that's alive today. Uh, they so which is really important when you're thinking about questions like how do you, how does a sensory system like an ear scale when the skull itself gets really really big does it actually perform in exact in the, in the same way as it does in something that has a skull that's about the size of a robin's and so in order to do that i am you know you, I'm, I'm looking at uh, modern animals and i am then as well as segmenting them in a bezo um, just like daniel is over there and after i managed to sort of digitally prepare uh, these specimens, I actually import those bones into this software called Maya, where I am able to actually digitally model these soft tissues and try to sort of constrain their size and position within the skull itself, uh, with, within some limitations, obviously. And a lot of these are very preliminary, but I've been able to sort of constrain the position of things like an eardrum, as well as some of these other uh, aspects of hearing anatomy. Great, thanks, Jen. That's, that's that's fabulous stuff. And for folks that are able to uh, to, to 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 see his talk at SVP next week, it's going to be it's going to be pretty amazing. Let me give you a, a brief look right here at some of the, the kinds of work that we're doing as well. We'll just sort of buzz through these. We spend a lot. I showed you T Rex's brain. We do a lot of work on the brains um, of of dinosaurs, and so we've got lots of them right here. We do lots of work um, again involving CT scanning. Uh, back in the old days, if we wanted to see what the brain structure was like, we would actually have to saw something in half, like this uh, rhea skull, which is an ostrich-like bird, and we would actually make um, a replica of the brain by put it, painting rubber, latex, inside right there to give a, a replica. We don't have to basically ruin a skull to do that anymore. We can run them through a CT scanner and get beautiful representations. Uh, for example, this is a turkey right here. We've got a major product project on turkey and the, the beauty, beauty of 3, uh, 3D printing. All of these were printed at the fabulous um, 3D printer at the Ohio University Innovation Center. As we can print these things life-size, so this is the life-size brain of this turkey, and we can print it way larger so we can actually see it better. We've done lots of different kinds of things. We've done flying reptiles. Uh, such as Anhanguera, a pterodactyl. Uh, this is the brain of, of Allosaurus, the guy that we looked at before. Uh, we've been working with um, uh, Dino de Grange down in Argentina on terror birds and their brains. We've done a lot of work on birds, and, and a recent uh, PhD student from our lab, Catherine Early, has done some really groundbreaking uh, work, and you can download um, her articles in the links in the description looking at some of the birds that are sort of the geniuses of the avian realm, like parrots. That's a parrot brain, and crows. These are animals that have incredible problem-solving skills. The question we have is, did some of the dinosaurs potentially have the kind of capabilities, the cognitive abilities that we associate with birds today? This is the, the brain of Troodon, which is one of the uh, supposedly the smartest dinosaur, according to, uh, to, to lore. Um, this is what its brain looks like, and the reality is it's not that different from what we see in something like an ostrich. This is an ostrich skull right there, and it's very similar in many ways, suggesting that there might have been some similarities. The reality with these brains is we just have a replica of the outside of the brain. We don't actually have the neural wiring, which is critical. But we've done a bunch, and so this is the brain that goes along with Majungasaurus. This is Stegosaurus, and this is what the brain of Stegosaurus um, looks like here as well. And all of these things provide us information. We've done a lot of work on the long-necked sauropod dinosaurs. This is Diplodocus. Um, this is actually a growth series right here of, of a dinosaur called Camarasaurus, another long-necked sort of brontosaurus sauropod. And this is the brain of this particular uh, sauropod here, Camarasaurus. Again, this 
This one came from uh, the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, a great partner, also found at Dinosaur National Monument. And so by looking at the brain structure, it gives us a window into their cognitive capabilities, but it also gives us a, a window into their senses, what senses were most important. And it looks like that the predatory dinosaurs had really heightened senses. And it real, it looks, it's looking like birds basically evolved a lot of their sensory capabilities from these small predatory dinosaurs, the one that Jan was, talk, Jan, that Jan was talking about previously. And they basically inherited a lot of those traits from animals that were really just experimenting um, with, with aerodynamics. Well, Larry, yeah. I have two sets. Sure. So you have a question about uh, Jen's uh, research and something that uh, she said. What is the smallest dinosaur? What is the smallest dinosaur? Well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, all of the babies were pretty small. Even the, these giant sauropods started out as eggs that were fairly modest um, in size. But something like um, uh, Archaeopteryx was very small. Some of the small predatory dinosaurs are really small. Um, and there's a variety of other little ones, um, little, little plant-eating dinosaurs um, that are actually quite small, something called frutidens, is like this little tiny skull. And so we find a lot of these. And the reality is that birds are dinosaurs. Birds are closely related to these small predatory dinosaurs like Troodon and Dromaeosaurus and Velociraptor. And modern birds, modern dinosaurs, get pretty small. Okay, well let's come into this other room over here. This is our collections room. And so we've got a lot going on in this room. Uh, you can sort of see we've got, this is where we've got lots of skulls. We've got cabinets that are loaded with, with specimens. Uh, almost all the specimens you see in here are of modern day animals. Um, although we do have some dinosaur skulls here. These are a couple of dinosaurs uh, that we actually worked on and, and we were involved in naming. This is from, this is Sarmientosaurus from um, a sauropod dinosaur, a titanosaur from South America. We did the brain endocast of this animal as well. This is a, um, an Asian plant-eating dinosaur from China um, uh, called Equijubus. We'd love to have a big triceratops skull, but our lab just isn't big enough to have a, a full-size one. So we've got a juvenile in pieces. So this is actually um, a young triceratops right here. The horn is broken off right here, the front of its face is missing over here, but you can see this big frill. But lots of modern day animals in here, all kinds of horses and cows and foxes and manatees, all kinds of things. There's an alligator laid out on the table. And we have Anna here. Um, hi, Anna. Um, Anna's um, an undergraduate here at Ohio University, and she's been working on a variety of projects. Um, Anna, what have you been working on lately? Yeah, um, so for my project right now, I'm basically looking at the CT scan data of the fossil of a dromaeosaurus skull. So from that, I'm basically trying to create a 3D visualization of what its brain endocast and inner ears might have looked like. So actually, this right here is a cast of what a full dromaeosaurus skull might have looked like. Um, and this here is actually pretty different from the data that I've got on my computer because, like Larry said, fossil data isn't perfect. So there's a lot of chunks missing. It's sort of fragmented. Um, so most of what I have access to it's actually this back portion of the skull right here. Um, but this is actually really valuable to look at still because that's where most of the animal's sensory organs would have been. Um, so for example, by taking a look at the inner ear of this dinosaur, we can tell a bit more about how well it might have been able to hear or how well it might have been able to balance itself. Um, we can also get a little bit more information about the dinosaur from looking at the brain, the endocast itself, just like how the animal might have been able to see or smell. Great, thanks Anna, that's, that's fascinating stuff. And so keep an eye on Anna, she's going to have some great research that will be coming out soon. So I'm going to go from the collections room, we'll navigate down here, and we're heading down this way. We've got their stuff, I mean, the reality is there's stories everywhere you look here. All of these fossils, all of these modern day animals, they all have stories to tell. Like this is the beautiful skull of Parasaurolophus, um, uh, another duck-billed dinosaur um, that we've been studying, fabulous looking animal with this amazing crest on it um, that was certainly a visual display organ, but almost certainly has to do with sound production as well. When you and I breathe in through our nose, the air just comes in the nose and down to the mouth. 
and that's what a lot of the dinosaurs were like. But for dinosaurs like um, uh, Parasaurolophus and its Lambiosaurine uh, cousins, the air actually came in the nose, went all the way around here through the crest and came back down into the, into the throat and with some little side chambers off here. And that would have affected the resonant properties of the voice, the vocal characteristics. Parasaurolophus had a very deep voice. And so that's something that, that, that we've been studying with, um, with some other colleagues. Done lots of work on these armored dinosaurs. This is Ankylosaurus itself, and this is a cousin of Ankylosaurus uh, called Euoplocephalus. So we've done lots of work on these different areas. Um, we were very pleased and highly honored recently that some of our research was actually featured in the latest um, issue on newsstands now. Of, of, of National Geographic magazine. I'll put on my National Geographic hat for this. Um, and we're thrilled that they came to our lab and that the, the famed um, Italian photographer Paolo Verzoni came here and actually took these amazing uh, images. Uh, that's with our T-Rex right in there. And this is, we took a, um, a specimen of, of crocodile, an um, eight and a half foot frozen Siamese crocodile to Ohio Health of Blennis Hospital. Um, and we were able to CT scan it there. We also worked on some infographics uh, with some of our studies. This was a project with Ryan Ridgely and led by David Evans at the Royal Ontario Museum, looking at cousins of Parasaurolophus, Hypacrosaurus, where we looked at its brain and the structure of the crest and how it related to vocal and sound production. We also, uh, we were fortunate that they did a, an infographic, a two-page spread, we're proud to, to say, um, on some of the research that we did that was led by another former uh, PhD student in our lab, a faculty member here now, uh, named Ruger Porter, looking at the physiological properties of the heads of these animals, particularly blood vessels, and how they were able to keep their brains cool while being very active animals. Um, so pretty cool to be in, in National Geographic, and we were grateful to be included among all the other great scientists there. Well, let's come into um, the last room that we have here. And this is our, our, our vertebrate anatomy preparation suite. Um, and there's Lydia Gisagi. We'll talk to Lydia in a second. This is where we do most of the heavy lifting with regard to the modern day anatomy stuff. Um, and this is sort of, we have dead animals in here. So if you're a little squeamish about that, you know, you'll, you'll um, just, just be, be warned. Uh, Lydia does lots of our dissections. And to get all these beautiful skeletons, these are skeletons that um, are basically in part of the process of, of becoming finalized skeletons that will eventually go um, in the collections. Uh, this was a specimen right here, an alligator that's still wet, uh, that was just uh, finished up. So Lydia, um, Lydia is actually a, um, a senior pre-veterinary major uh, who's been working in our lab. This is our third year working in our lab, and she sort of runs this, uh, this facility in here. <laughs> and so uh, uh, what are you doing right now, Lydia? Right now, I am numbering bones. So this great horn owl is going to be number 116676 in the OUBC. Um, everyone gets their own individual number, so everyone on here has one at least. And then I am in the final steps before they go into the collections room. So where do we start? We start first in the gross part, and that is taking apart the animal. Um, after I dissect the majority of it, it gets hung up up there, and then it becomes jerky, <laughs> as gross as that sounds. And then we take it over here to the bugs. Um, a lot of people are squeamish about bugs, so we'll just leave them in there. Um, and then after they're done, they will go into an ammonia and peroxide bath, and they get cleaned and then whitened, and so they're nice and pearly. Yeah, so that's what we're looking at right here. This one just, this is an alligator that just came out, it's still wet. Um, and so we've got dermestid beetles that do a lot of the, the cleaning. It's a very natural process. Um, and then we just lay them out here. We keep them on a nice clean table so they can dry. This is a loon that we did, and I kind of like loons, so I actually wound up putting it together. Um, and this is a, um, a guinea fowl here, which is sort of a chicken-like animal with a crest on its head, donated by one of our, um, our faculty members, Scott Moody. Uh, this is an interesting one right here. This is an Ohio bobcat. And so we are the Ohio bobcats. That's our sports name. Um, and it turns out that bobcats are threatened animals throughout much of our range. In Ohio University, um, uh, Professor Villarreal Popescu has a major project going uh, with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources where they're censusing bobcats. 
And all the bobcats we're getting are actually coming from uh, the, the ODNR, uh, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, which are natural casualties, or if being hit by a car is a natural casualty, because uh, most of these um, are roadkill. And so we're collecting all kinds of information about sex and age and physical condition. And then when they come here, we actually generate them into, into beautiful skeletons uh, that can be studied forever. And so here's just a regular old house cat right here. And that shows you what the size of a bobcat is compared to a, a little old kitty cat. And let me tell you sort of where we get some of these animals. So there's lots of animals in here. And a question I get a lot is, so are you guys like going out and shooting all these animals? How are you getting all these modern day animals? And the reality is that we don't kill anything. Everything comes to us from um, official legal sources. Uh, we get specimens from zoos, but a major source of our specimens, or the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, but a major source and major partners are uh, various wildlife rehabilitation facilities. Uh, for example, um, um, uh, like the loon, for example, was an animal that died of natural uh, casualties. It was injured in some way and brought to a wildlife rehabilitation facility. The rehabbers do a fabulous job, but they're not batting a thousand. They're not successful every single time. And so some of the animals have to be humanely euthanized. And then they come here. Um, uh, and so a lot of the rehabbers are very happy to be working with us because many of the animals they get in are in a sense animals that died or were injured because of human activities. Whether they were hit by cars or poisoned or something like a loon or a pelican was um, injured or killed from the fisheries industry. And sort of, it's sort of sad, but then the rehabbers sort of view that when they come here, they sort of have an afterlife, a second life in science, education and research. And we take that very seriously. Same thing with these albatross. Um, very rare sort of oceanic birds. Um, uh, these came from Hawaii. Um, and I got contacted by uh, somebody from the U.S. Fish and Game um, on the island of Kauai. And they said that they had heard through the grapevine that, they were, that we were a good home for these birds. These were birds that um, were killed, um, killed and then held in a legal proceeding. Um, some guy let his dogs into a breeding colony of these albatrosses, and the dogs went through and killed like two or three dozen of these albatross. Didn't eat any of them, just killed them. Um, and so the guy was arrested, and the birds were held in as, as part of the legal, as evidence in the legal proceeding. And when they died, they just didn't feel like they would incinerate them or bury them. It just seemed like such a waste. And so they've been very happy that they could come here. All of these specimens are accessioned into our Ohio University vertebrate collection. We've published multiple articles that have included information from them. So we get lots of animals in. They're all natural casualties or coming from, from zoos. Um, again, here's some of the other tools that we use here. You've seen us use computers and CT scanners, uh, but we also use chainsaws and band saws. And one of the last things I'll show you right here, and, and again, this is, you're going to see some dead animals. This is our walk-in freezer. We've got freezers all over, over here to sort of accommodate all these animals as they're coming in. And so this is our walk-in freezer here. Thanks, Lydia. And you can see a lot of the animals that have come in here. And so here's that eight and a half foot um, Siamese crocodile that, we, um, that came from a facility in North Carolina. It died of natural causes. Um, and we CT scanned this multiple times, including uh, for, for National Geographic. That rhinoceros actually came from the Phoenix Zoo, was air freighted from the Phoenix Zoo after it died. It was a 42-year-old male named Ketla who died of, of cancer. Ketla was sort of a, a celebrity at the Phoenix Zoo, and we were honored when Ketla came here for research. We have published multiple articles that have used data from Ketla. And so we've got all kinds of things in here, manatees, and, and there's all kinds of birds, there's a bison, there's uh, reptiles in here. And the reality is, and lots of bobcats, the reality is all of these modern day animals actually relate to our work on, on dinosaurs. So if we want to understand dinosaurs, we need to know what's, what's um, covering the bones. How are the, these bones fleshed out and animated by the soft tissues. So the birds are the most closely related. Crocodiles are still really informative. But even some of these mammals, 
uh, some of these things like rhinos and giraffes and manatees, they still represent um, um, animals that are often within the size range of dinosaurs. And so they can provide clues for what might be going on uh, with dinosaurs as well. So we're just about out of time here. We've had sort of a whirlwind tour through, uh, through Whitmer Lab today. You've seen lots of different kinds of things, everything ranging from, from dinosaurs to, to crows and, and turkeys and um, all kinds of, of, of other animals. And all of these different projects are, are intended to give us a, a sense of the history of life on our planet. Every single one of these objects right here has a story to tell. We weren't able to actually tell all of their stories for you. That would take a long time. But that's sort of what our lab is, is, is devoted to, is trying to understand what each of these threads in the history of life mean when we try to weave them together into an evolutionary tapestry. And indeed, all of these animals shed light, in a sense, on all other animals. In some cases, they tell us how animals work, how they functioned. Um, in other cases, they give us a sense of, of exactly what kinds of soft tissues and physiologies and behaviors we should expect to see in dinosaurs. And so with that, I think we're just about out of time. We may have even gone a little bit long. Um, I don't know if we've got any questions. We do have several questions, and one of the first things that I want to say is, is that Dr. Whitmer has uh, committed to looking at all the questions in the chat, and he will provide answers. So I realize that we did get overwhelmed with questions today. But this one came in very early, and I didn't know where to insert it. So it says, did uh, Therizino, if I'm pronouncing it right, travel in packs or herds? Ah, Therizinosaurs, yeah. So it's a question of these, they're very bizarre sort of um, predator, they evolved from predatory dinosaurs, but they were herbivorous dinosaurs, they're theropods. Therizinosaurs are very bizarre dinosaurs that have been mysterious animals since, their incep since we first found them, and they remain very, um, uh, very mysterious. Um, and the answer is we don't really know whether they, they, they hunted in packs or whether they were, uh, whether they were um, individual or m most of them probably didn't hunt because they actually ate, ate plants. And the reality is it can be difficult to, 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 to get some of these, these, these pieces of information out of the fossil record. So for example, if we look at a lion and a tiger, strip off the fur, they're really, really similar. Their bones are really similar. But if you think about their biologies, they're kind of different. Sure, they both eat you know, large mammals, um, like deer and gazelle and things like that. Um, but um, um, tigers are almost entirely solitary hunters, whereas lions hunt in a pack, very coordinated social hunters. So we've often had questions, were tyrannosaurs? Uh, social hunters? Did they hunt in packs? Did Velociraptor hunt in packs? It's difficult for us to know. And the reality is there's lots of reasons for animals to be together. We often find dinosaurs together, and there's often a, an implied sense of sociality. And indeed, lots of dinosaurs probably were social animals. But sometimes animals are together because they're kids hanging out in a group or a family group, and that's what we might expect as well. And there's lots of benefits to working in a group. And so that's a great question. We don't know that much about Therizinosaurus, um, but that's something that we'd love to be able to get more information on. Um, question, do you have fossilized eggs? And if so, what might you have learned from them? Yeah, we do have some fossilized eggs. I've actually got one over here, a replica. Um, of an egg right here. And so, um, yeah, we can learn a lot from eggs. We can learn a lot but from the egg shells, and there's been lots of study of dinosaur eggs. In fact, there's a fabulous, if you get the, the recent um, um, uh, Na uh, National Geographic um, magazine, you'll find a fabulous section in there about some work going on at Yale by um, Yasmina Viman um, that's looking at um, um, egg structure in, in, in dinosaurs. So we can learn a lot about eggs. What's even more exciting is if there's something inside the egg, if there's an embryo inside. In fact, we have been finding embryos in different kinds of eggs. We haven't actually had the pleasure of working on, on those ourselves. Some of these other little dinosaurs 
like this little dryosaurus that Daniel's been working on was probably um, older than a hatchling. It was probably, uh, this animal was probably about this long, more or less. And so, not quite uh, an egg or a hatchling, uh, but something pretty close. So we can learn a lot about dinosaurs from, from their eggs, particularly if there's embryos inside. So, what do you think about shrink wrapping in artistic reconstructions, and how would you go about determining fat deposits in the body of fossils? Yeah, that's a great, um, a, a great question. And in fact, we have lots of, of interest in our research because it does impact the appearance of dinosaurs. Our research isn't actually directed towards understanding how dinosaurs looked, but we wind up learning something about what dinosaurs look like uh, because of, of the work we do. So for example, uh, the idea of being a shrink wrap is sort of a, a school of, of dinosaur art that in a sense puts the skin on really, really tight such that we see all of these openings in the skull. Uh, the reality is that um, we probably didn't really see all of these, these things right here. The, 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 the flesh was, was probably filled out in large, large measure um, um, by, by the other, other tissues. Although we probably had something different that looked here. So this part of the face probably looked different than this part of the face of T-Rex uh, right in here as well. And so the reality is that we're starting to get better at that, trying to understand what the skin was like, what I mentioned at the outset, can give us a sense of skin thickness, also the details of what's in here in terms of, of the air sinus that's in here or the muscles that are in here. They will impact um, how we, in a sense, lay the skin over the top of it. From what our standpoint is, is yes, the appearance of dinosaurs is, is interesting and cool and it's part of the whole uh, dinosaur art and the artistic uh, representation of dinosaurs. For us as functional biologists, we're interested in what's going on underneath and how the different appearances might actually reflect differences in functioning underneath. So it is something that we're interested in uh, because it can be very important, particularly when some of these differences in appearance relate to what clearly must relate to social behavior. What we see in many kinds of dinosaurs, just like we see in, in antelopes and, and, and cattle and giraffes, are some sort of horns or other sorts of facial um, appendages. We look at each other and we look at each other in the face, which is why um, having these masks on has been so almost debilitating in terms of communication, which is why we're not wearing our masks right now. It, and so the, our, the goal with our trying to understand dinosaurs, as we look at these appearances, we're trying to understand what those might actually mean for the behaviors of dinosaurs. Do the differences in appearance relate to age, sexual maturity, or, or, or their sex themselves, whether they're males or females? And so these are the kinds of questions that we're trying to get at. Let me interject a question about that then. Um, so the question is, is that if we know that structures suggest that the dinosaurs could make noise and also had a hearing apparatus, did they use those communication capabilities for behavior? So for example, to pack hunt or to strategize, what additional information might you have that would suggest that? Yeah, yeah. And that's, and that's why some of the work that, that, that Jan Nassif is doing is so important, because it actually relates to the hearing apparatus. And, and some of the things that, that she's finding are lining up with other things that we've been, been looking at. So I mentioned to you before that something like Parasaurolophus, or Parasaurolophus, if you want to pronounce it that way, has this big air crest, or crest that's running through its snout that would have deepened its voice. It would have had a very low voice. Jan's finding out that a lot of these dinosaurs may have had their peak sensitivities to sounds at very low frequencies. It's very possible that if we were transported back into the age of dinosaurs, we wouldn't be hearing a lot of what's going on. It would actually be in, in, in the realm of what we call infrasound, which is a sort of a, a human term, meaning that we can't hear it. But a lot of these animals, including animals today, hear at very low frequencies. Something like T-Rex was probably hearing things that were, we would regard it mostly as almost rumble, something that we would feel. And the reality is low frequency sounds are very effective for, for animals. They actually are transmitted over long distance without dying down very much, without attenuating. So um, understanding these sensory capabilities are absolutely critical for us to try to understand these dinosaurs as living, breathing creatures. 
So last question, we're going to give it to you for T-Rex since it's her birthday. <laughs> um, could you figure out the approximate bite force of a T-Rex and how would it compare to any living animal? Sure, yeah. And the T-Rex, the bite force of T-Rex has been something that, that, that a lot of people have worked on because um, it must have been incredible. Because just as we were talking about before, the jaw muscles of T-Rex are absolutely enormous. If you look at the depth of the lower jaw here, and Colin, if you swing around and look at something like um, Allosaurus or Majungasaurus up here, you can see that the lower jaw isn't anywhere near proportionally as deep as what we see in T-Rex. T-Rex had enormous jaw muscles, and the teeth were adapted for biting into things without just snapping. Um, and that was something that happened during growth. They got, uh, became hard biters um, as they got older. So yes, people have actually calculated uh, the bite forces for these animals, and they were enormous. They actually were you know, greater than what we see in crocodilians today, which are some of the hardest biting, biting animals, and much harder biters than, say, you know, a lion or something like that. And so, um, yeah, uh, there's actually good, good math, good engineering approaches. Uh, my former student Casey Holliday has done some excellent work on that. Uh, the muscles are obviously key players, as well as the general skull construction. In fact, you can download some articles that are, li are linked in the, in the description that will talk about bite force in T-Rex. Well, at this point, I want to thank you and your lab so much for sharing your space and your knowledge and your enthusiasm. And I just want to remind everybody about uh, the next Science Cafe that we will be having with Paul Benedict. Uh, the title, Impact Research, Rallying People and Resources to Your Cause. Until next time, we wish everybody be safe. And if I could just interject here at, at, at the end, the voice that you've been listening to is Roxanne Molly Bruni, who's um, the organizer of our Science Cafe series. Um, and works in uh, the research office, in the office of the Vice President for Research and creati Creative Activity. So thanks all for coming today, and I, I promise I will go through all the questions and try to answer them all um, as, soon, as soon as I can. So thanks for your attention, and have a good evening.